Okay, so today's lecture is on the hip and the leg. When I talk about leg, I'm talking about your thigh. Um, what I want you to get at is this is describe the bones that make up the pelvis and the hip, describe the muscles of the pelvis and the hip, and describe the lumbosacral plexus. So the bones of the hip and the leg that we're talking about is your hip bone is actually also your pelvis, but your hip bone is actually formed by the ilium, ischium, and pubis that are generally fused together to form your pelvis. At birth, these three bones are joined by hyaline cartilage, but begin to fuse around 15 to 17 years old and completely fused by 20 to 25. So although they're rigidly fused by adult hook, their names are still used to describe the three parts of the hip bone. Okay, so you have your ilium, which is this large part up here. So if you, you when you um, stand and put your hands kind of on what, what most people think of as their waist, you're actually on the ilium. And then posteriorly, you have the ischium. This is where we tend to sit. And then the pubic bone in front. Okay, so these three bones fused together by adulthood are considered the hip bone itself or your pelvis. The ilium is the superior and largest part of your hip bone. The body joins with the bodies of the ischium and the pubis to form the acetabulum, and that is the socket where the femoral head will sit. And that actually forms your hip joint. So the ala or wing is a thin wing-like posterior lateral portion of the ilium that serves as an attachment site for muscle. Anterior and posterior, there are two projections called the anterior, posterior, superior, and anterior, posterior, inferior iliac spines. These two are atta site attachments for uh, muscle and ligament. Okay, so here is your ilium, right? This whole thing is it. This is all the body of the ilium. Here is your acetabulum. If you notice that your acetabulum is actually formed almost in thirds by your ilium, ischium, and your pubis, a little less than a third from your pubis. Okay, but back to the ilium. We have this large iliac crest, and again, that's the top of your where you tend to say your waist is. Your ala or wing is this big bony, it looks sort of like a fossa, and this is really where your um, gluteus medius is going to sit. You have your anterior superior iliac spine, ASIS, we tend to call it, and your anterior inferior iliac spine. Okay, you also have those on the back, so that's your posterior superior iliac spine and your posterior inferior iliac spine. Your anterior um, superior and inferior iliac spines are used a lot more as a guide for palpation um, because your ASIS particularly is very palpable. AS, the AIIS, the anterior inferior iliac spine, is a little less palpable, but on a thinner person you can find it. Your posterior superior and inferior iliac spine are really tough to palpate because your glutes are sitting on top of them, so it's tough to get through the glutes to palpate those. Okay, and this is just the other side of the um, ilium. So here is the only big difference here I want you to notice is the auricle, the auricular surface, and this is where you're going to articulate with the sacrum to form the sacroiliac joint. Okay, so again, this is the front because here's your AESIS and your AIIS, and here are your posterior iliac and superior and inferior iliac spines. Okay, your iliac crest is a broad, thickened, superior border of the ilium that runs from the ASIS to the PSIS. You have the greater sciatic notch as a cutout inferior to the posterior inferior iliac spine. On the lateral surface of the wing, there are three rough curved lines, the anterior, posterior, and inferior gluteal lines that mark the origins of gluteal muscles. These are not palpable um, because, again, the glutes are sitting on them, but if we remove the glutes from one of the ilia, you may be able to see them. Okay, but again, look, it's just these lines. So here is your anterior, your gluteal lines, your anterior, inferior, and posterior. Um, again, really just attachments for the glutes and even not great ones because when we look at the glutes, you'll see that there's this broad fascial sort of attachment, not just to those lines. Ischium forms the posterior inferior part of the hip bone. The superior part of the body um, of the ischium fuses with the pubis and ilium to form the posterior inferior aspect of the acetabulum. Inferior part is referred to as the ramus and joins with the ramus of the pubic bone 
to form the boundaries of the obturator foramen. Ischial spine is inferior to the greater sciatic notch and serves as a site for ligament attachment. Okay, so here is your ischial spine. Again, not really palpable. You have a lesser sciatic notch. This is primarily your body and your ischial. Okay, here is your ischial tuberosity. Okay, this is very, very palpable, and it's where we tend to sit when we um, sit properly. We should be sitting on the ITs, or ischial tuberosities, as we call them. Um, very palpable site for your hamstring attachments. And then you have your ramus of your ischium, and you'll, and you'll see that this, the ramus of the ischium joins with the ramus of the pubis and create this obturator foramen, which, of course, the obturator nerve is going to pass through. And then here you'll see its part, its contribution to the formation of the acetabulum. Pubis bones forms the anterior medial part of the hip bone, contributes to the anterior part of the acetabulum. Flattened body and two rami, superior and inferior ramus. The symphysial crest, crest or surface is the area that articulates with the pubic symphysis. The pubic tubercle serves as an attachment for the inguinal ligament. The pectineal line serves as an attachment for the pectineus. So pubis is much less uh, exciting. Sorry, it's over here. Here's your superior pubic ramus. Your inferior ramus is going to be down here. Those are the two main things. And the other thing you want to know is the symphysial surface. The pubic joint itself is a symphysis. It's a sliding joint with a, with a disc in between. And the right and left um, symphysial surfaces form the sym pubic symphysis. Okay, the obturator foramen, pointed out in the picture, bounded by the pubis and the ischium and the rami. Um, it is a small passageway for the obturator nerve and vessels. Obturator foramen is closed by a thin but strong membrane called the obturator membrane, which is spelled wrong. Uh, the foramen helps to minimize bony bulk in the area, while the membrane maintains the surface area needed for um, muscle attachment. Okay, so here you go. Here's your obturator foramen. You've got your obturator artery in there. Your obturator nerve is in there. And then you have this obturator membrane, which, which is a fibrous structure that, that sort of fills the hole. The acetabulum. Very important. This is the socket for the hip, the hip, the femoral head. And that femoral head inside this acetabulum forms your actual hip joint. It's a large cup-shaped cavity in the lateral aspect of the hip bone. Very important stuff. So wait, let me go back to the acetabulum a little bit. Um, we're going to talk in, in kinesiology about the acetabulum and its position and its orientation, but it has it plays a large role in how your hips end up being positioned in adulthood, how it orients itself into space, and what um, how your femoral head fits into it, especially in pediatrics and developmental hip dysplasia. Okay, femur, longest and heaviest bone in your body. Proximal end consists of a head and neck, greater and lesser trochanters. So in the humerus, they're greater and lesser tubercles. In the femur, they're greater and lesser trochanters. This is the kind of thing that trips you up on the practical, that you'll put that there is a greater tubercle on the femur instead of saying greater trochanter, and unfortunately it would be wrong. Uh, so try and keep those terms straight. On the head of the femur is a depression called the fovea, which serves as a ligament attachment for the ligament of the head of the femur. Uh, the place where the neck of the femur joins the shaft anteriorly, there's an intertrochanteric line. So just as it says, it's intertrochanteric. It runs between the greater and lesser trochanters. The intertrochanteric crest joins the greater and lesser trochanters posteriorly. Okay, so here's your intertrochanteric line on the anterior and you have intertrochanteric crest posteriorly. Okay, so the line is anterior, crest is posterior. Okay, you have your, your femoral head, you have the neck that goes between the head and the shaft, your greater trochanter is this large thing, your lesser trochanter is a smaller one on the medial side. Okay, then you have your shaft, you have a lateral epicondyle, a medial epicondyle, and patellar surface in between. Posterior view, you still have your head, your neck, you have your intertrochanteric crest, your lesser trochanter again, still your greater trochanter, shaft, the, the linea aspera um, is part of the attachment for the hamstrings, but again, 
Um, it's such a broad sort of attachment that we're not going to focus on that very much. Okay, so again, your linear asparagus is broad, rough, lot, and posterior surface, muscle attachment site. Um, again, not palpable. And again, we'll barely see it on a cadaver unless we, we take all the musculature off, um, which we might do. Uh, so do we care about these lines? No, I'm not going to go into any more detail about that line. I'm just going to show you the line again. Um, okay, so your femur, the medial lateral condyles make up nearly the entire distal end of the femur. The condyles are separated by an intercondylar fossa. Shallow anterior depression is called the patellar surface. And the lateral surface, the lateral condyle has a central projection that's called the lateral epicondyle. And there's a medial epicondyle on the medial side, which is much larger. On the medial epicondyle as well, you have the adductor tubercle. And this does serve as an attachment site for the adductor muscles. Okay, so if we look at the distal end, we have this lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle. You'll notice when we palpate these, and I'll tell you again when we palpate them, that it's very difficult, if sometimes impossible, to differentiate the medial epicondyle from the adductor tubercle. Okay, they're very close together, and in some people they just sort of feel like a single bump. In fact, in most people they feel like a single bump. Please note, too, that the epicondyles are on top of the condyles. They are technically part of the condyles. They're just the most, the epicondyles are the most prominent or pointy part of the condyle, and that's the best way for you to think about when, you, especially when you have to palpate them. Okay, then on the anterior view, in between the condyles, you have this patellar surface, and that's where your patella is going to articulate with the, fe the femur. And posteriorly, you have an intercondylar fossa. Okay, so posteriorly, it's intercondylar fossa. Anteriorly, it's intercondylar a patellar surface. Okay, the hip joint itself is a, a ball and socket type of joint. It's around the head of the femur, articulating with that acetabulum. Um, the acetabulum, just like in the shoulder, we talked about glenoid labrum. There's an acetabular labrum as well that helps deepen the socket and increase the stability of the hip joint. You have flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, rotation, and something we call circumduction that can occur at the hip joint. Okay, so here's your hip joint. Here is your acetabular labrum, right? It is cartilaginous. It deepens your acetabular socket, and it articulates with the head of the femur. Okay. You have a ton of ligaments supporting your hip joint. The most important, I'd have to say, is the iliofemoral ligament. It attaches to the anterior, inferior, anterior iliac spine and rim of the acetabulum. And it crosses over the hip joint to attach the intertrochanteric line. It is Y-shaped. Sometimes it is called the Y ligament. Fibers run inferior laterally. As you go to stand, this ligament twists the femur into the acetabulum. Um, and we may actually get to see this. Um, I was working on some cadavers this summer, and if we get this particular type of embalming that, that we had this summer, you'll actually get to see this twisting motion. As you move the hip from flexion into extension, you'll see that ligament twist, um, and it kind of sucks the femoral head into the acetabulum to make it a little bit more um, stable. You have a pubofemoral ligament attached to the upper part of the superior pubic ramus and the pubic bone, crosses the hip joint, and blends into the iliofemoral ligament and fibrous capsules. So again, this is another area where these delineations of origin and insertion really are not this clear cut. The textbooks like to chop them out as goes from here to here, but generally these things tend to run together. And then you have your ischial femoral located on the posterior surface of the articulation, attaches to the ischial um, part of the acetabular rim, and then is going to run out towards the neck of the femur and the greater trochanter. This one pre prevents excess of medial rotation and also posterior dislocation of the head if your femur is in hyperflexion. So if you had your knee up real high towards your chest, you had your hip flexed fully, and there was a large force that came at you from the front on your knee, um, this ligament would prevent a posterior dislocation of the femoral head. 
Okay, you also have your zona orbicularis. Not really a ligament, but it's a thickening of the joint capsule that just runs sort of circular um, around the head of the femur and helps to stabilize the joint posteriorly. Again, cadaverically, we're not going to be able to differentiate this from the rest of the ischiofemoral ligament. Okay, your transverse acetabular ligament. This one we should be able to see. This one actually forms the inferior surface of the acetabulum. So you have your acetabular labrum that is running about three quarters of the way around the acetabulum, but then you have this transverse acetabular ligament that connects the medial and lateral parts of the uh, acetabular labrum. Um, what this ligament does, it helps to prevent inferior dislocation of the femoral head. And then you have the ligament of the head of the femur. This one goes right from the acetabula itself to the head of the femur. There's a fovea in the head of the femur or a hole that this ligament um, runs to. It doesn't really prevent movement too long. It's, if you're going to dislocate, this thing's going to rupture very quickly. But the important thing is that it carries the artery of the head of the femur, which supplies the head of the femur. So um, it's very important that when this is disrupted, you may have a loss of blood supply to the head of the femur, and the head of the femur could die, become necrotic. Okay, the other joint you have here is your sacroiliac joint. There are actually two of them, one on each side. It's a very strong weight-bearing joint, and it's the anterior joint between the auricular surface of the ilium and the auricular surface of the sacrum. Okay, a posterior joint between the sacral tuberosities on the sacrum and the iliac tuberosities on the ilium. We really only talk about the sacroiliac joint as being this articulation between the ilium and the sacrum. When you see it, it really looks like one joint surface. Right, so here's your sacroiliac joint. They're describing it as posterior, this is an anterior view, and then a posterior view, but it, it, clinically it is thought of as the sacroiliac joint, not two joints. Lots of ligamentous support around here. You have anterior and posterior sacroiliac ligaments to help hold those bones together. There's an interosseous sacroiliac ligament and a sacrotuberous. The sacrotuberous passes from the posterior ilium down to the ischial tuberosity. Um, and this we will find on the cadavers. It's actually a very good landmark to help you find where you are in the buttock area. Okay, so you have, this is an anterior view. Here, here are your anterior Sacroiliac ligaments, again, this big, broad, complex blending of, of uh, ligaments together. Down here, this is your sacrotuberous, so it's running from the spine of the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity posteriorly. Okay, and then you have a sacrospinous um, running from the sacrum to the spine of the ilium. This is now a posterior view. So here's just showing you the same thing, sacrospinous and sacrotuberous. Sacrotuberous is running down to, sacro, to the ischial tuberosity. Sacrospinous is running horizontally across. And then you have your posterior sacroiliac ligaments all up here. Again, this all looks like one very broad um, fascial sheath on the cadavers. We, off, we definitely can find sacrotuberous, and sometimes we can differentiate sacrospinous. But um, it's under sacrotuberous, so sometimes we lose it with sacrospinous. Okay, your pubic symphysis is the third joint. It's a symph symphysial surface of the pubic bones articulating with a fibrocartilaginous disc. You have very little movement here, um, but if you have ileal and ischial movement, you'll have pubic movement. These, your ilia and ischia cannot move without movement occurring at the pubic symphysis, which is right here. So obviously this is an x-ray of the pelvis and hip area, and here is your pubic symphysis. Um, Obvi the, I would think this is obvious, but the, the most movement you get during, at this joint is during labor and delivery uh, for your pelvis to open and allow passage of the fetus. Okay, so let's talk about some musculature of the thigh. They are anterior thigh muscles, and they are the hip flexors and knee extensors, mainly innervated by the femoral nerve. You have the medial thigh muscles that are mainly adductors and innervated by the obturator nerve. And your posterior thigh muscles are the hamstrings and innervated by sciatic nerve. 
so a little easier to know the innervations here because if it's anterior it's femoral if it's medial it's obturator if it's posterior it's sciatic so um, it fits a little neater here in the thigh area muscles of your anterior thigh are the iliopsoas chief and most powerful flexor of the thigh when I mean you have to think in these terms when I say flex of the thigh clinically what you're going to see is hip flexion most of its mass is located in the posterior wall of the abdomen if you remember we pointed out iliopsoas in the previous lecture made of two muscles the psoas major and minor and the iliacus act to flex the free limb such as in the swing phase of gait or when lifting your leg to climb stairs but if you are standing and your feet are fixed on the floor Iliosos can also flex the trunk, so it can pull your lumbar spine into flexion. Anterior thigh, your quadriceps femor femoris. These are your quads, okay? The main bulk of the anterior thigh. Um, four parts, the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. Each of the four individual muscles has its own origin, but the tendons unite to form a um, single broad uh, aponeurosis and the quadricep tendon. The patellar ligament is a continuation of the quadricep tendon as it wraps around the feet, the patella, and it sort of embeds the patella in this fascia and then attaches the patella to the um, tibia anteriorly at the patella tuberosity. Okay, so here are the muscles of your anterior thigh. You've got vastus medialis. You've got the, the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, and then intermedialis is going to be behind and underneath deep to the rectus femoris. Okay, and here you have, this is the um, tendon. If you see all of these, so here's tendon, vastus lateralis, here's rectus femoris, medialis is sort of underneath. They all form one big broad attachment here that sort of engulfs and wraps around the patella and then continues down to the tibial tuberosity and becomes the patellar ligament. Your other muscle here is your sartorius. This is a large, stra long, strap-like muscle. It crosses two joints. So if you notice here, it's starting on the anterior superior iliac spine. And is, so that means it's crossing the hip joint. And it also then goes down and inserts into what we'll call the pes anserarian later. And that is on the tibia, so it is also crossing the knee. So it is a two-joint muscle. It has the ability to both flex the hip and to extend the knee. It also can weakly abduct and loudly rotate the thigh at the hip, although I think it is really, really sort of a, a weak muscle at that. We tend to call it the tailor muscle. Sometimes it's called the tailor muscle because it can flex, externally rotate, and abduct. So when you're going to um, put your ankle on the opposite knee and you cross your leg, um, the sartorius does all of those motions. Tensor fascia lato, whether it belongs in anterior or lateral thigh, I'm not really sure. I tend to think of it as more lateral, but it can be either. Um, the muscle inserts into iliotibial tract. Everybody heard of IT band syndrome? That's this muscle. Primarily acts to flex the thigh at the hip because of its anterior location. However, it generally doesn't act independently. It assists iliopsoas and rectus femoris. Um, it can also assist the abductors and medial rotators. Um, and it also helps stabilize the femur in standing. So it does lots of things, but when you see it, it's really quite a small muscle. So it doesn't develop a whole lot of force. Here is your tensor fasciolata. Okay, the tensor fasciolata is going to continue distally and turn into the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract is fascia. It is not muscle. It's very thick, leathery light -like stuff. Um, so the tensor fasciolata is just a muscular part, but it does continue and become the iliotibial tract. Medial thigh, your adductors, pectineus, adductor longus, adductor brevis, adductor magnus, gracilis, and obturator externus. General rules. All of them originate from some part of the pelvis. All except gracilis insert into the femur. All except obturator externus are hip adductors. And all except pectineus are innervated by the obturator nerve. Pectineus has its own nerve, the nerve to pectineus. There's your little pectineus. Little tiny muscle. 
And then your adductors, very difficult to see because they're deep to the quadriceps, um, but you'll see the gracilis is the long medial, again, a medial strap-like muscle, and then your adductors are deep to that, much easier to see on a cadaver. So here they are. Here is gracilis. Nope, oh, nope, this is adductor. Yep, that's gracilis. And then you have adductor magnus. You have pectineus underneath, iliopsoas cut here, and um, the other adductors are deep to this. Adductor magnus. Again, these, these origins and insertions are here, but please go by the muscle charts. Uh, the magnus has both hamstring and adductor parts to it, so it is both a knee flexor and an adductor. Oh, and here is gracilis. Obturator externus, this little teeny tiny muscle here deep in the, in the butt area. So here's obturator externus, and there's an obturator internus as well, but they're very small muscles, but we'll find them. Posterior thigh, your hamstring group, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and bicep femoris. Again, refer to your charts for origins and assertions. They have a, a proximal attachment of the ischial tuberosity. All cause uh, extension of the thigh or the hip and flexion of the lower leg. All of them are innervated by sciatic nerve, a nice neat muscle group. Okay, your bicep femoris has both a long head and a short head, long head and a short head. You have um, semitendinosis comes medially, bicep femoris goes lateral. Semitendinosis and membranosis are both medial attachments. That's how you can differentiate them. Tendinosis on top, membranosis is, is deep to semitendinosis, and the both heads of the bicep femoris are going to go to the lateral surface of the knee. The gluteal region. Three large gluteal muscles, which are hip extensors and abductors, and five smaller deep muscles, and mainly are lateral hip rotators. So your gluteus medius and minimus, fan-shaped muscles. They sit into that ileal fossa, share the same action in nerve supply. Look to your charts for those. So you've got, again, we have to talk about layers here, right? Gluteus maximus is the top layer. Deep to maximus is glute medius and the minimus. Okay, so you have to reflect glute maximus before you can see medius and minimus. Okay, here is minimus, and here is medius. Okay, again, you look, minimus is kind of under medius, so we're talking layers here. And then you have a little piriformis muscle that also runs in that area. So your piriformis is a pear-shaped muscle that sits in the posterior pelvis. Um, the most significant thing we know about this piriformis muscle is that the sciatic nerve either passes under it or through it, depending on the individual's anatomy. So very important in treatment of sciatica. And here's just all of them deep. Uh, I'm going to try and pull up anatomy TV and show you these later. OK, other muscles of the gluteal re region, obturator internus, superior gemelli, inferior gemelli, form a tricipital muscle called the triceps coxae. And they occupy the space between piriformis and quadratus femoris. Common insertion of these muscles is the medial surface of the greater trochanter. Um, we tend to look at them as a unit because they cannot act independently, so when they act, they act together. And here they are, deep in here. You have superior gemelli, nice tiny little guy, inferior gemelli, and the um, this should be quadratus, I believe, quadratus femoris. Superior gemelli, obturator internus, and the inferior gemelli. Obturator internus is Difficult to find on the on the cadavers, but we'll find it in um, superior and inferior gemelli. We can find it. Quadratus femoris, a flat muscle inferior to obturator internus and the gemelli muscle. Okay. Okay. So let's look at um, some of the hip musculature here. Here you have gracilis, adductor magnus, pectineus, and the obturator externus. OK? 
Okay, so we're going from deep to superficial now. We're going to add on now here, adductor brevis. Okay, you've added gracilis. Iliosoas, tendon, gluteus minimus. So let's turn this a bit. Okay, here is gluteus minimus. Here is piriformis. Okay, now on top of this, we're going to layer in. Here is now glute medius. Okay. Let's go on ahead right here and add in gluteus maximus. Okay, in in reality, I have to honestly say, in reality, yeah, reality, maximus is going to cover more of medius than than this is showing. Let's go back a little bit. Okay, here's that. You know, we're still on the posterior side now, so here's adductor magnus from the posterior side. Let's go back around to the front and start layering in some more. Okay, so adductor brevis we saw already, right? Okay, we're starting to add in our quads now. So here is vastus medialis. Let's rotate a little bit more. Okay, vastus medialis, vastus intermedialis. Now, on top of that, we're going to add in rectus femoris. Okay? Vastus lateralis, medialis, femoris on top. Now we've added in that tensor fasciolata and that big, beautiful ITB band. Okay? So you've still got maximus, medius, Iliotibial tract. And see how this all just broadening joins in together? Okay, and we've got bicep femoris long head, vastus lateralis, semitendinosus, semimembranosus. Okay, really just one layer posteriorly is the, is the hamstring muscles. Nicely, one layer. Okay, let's get back to our lecture. Okay, the lumbosacral plexus. So you have brachial plexus, obviously, right, in the arm. In the lower extremities, you have a lumbosacral plexus formed by the lumbar and sacral nerve plexi, named the lumbosacral plexus because it is substantial overlap between the two. Um, many fibers from the lumbar plexus contribute to the sacral plexus. Formed by the anterior rami of the spinal nerves L1 through S4. Small contribution from T12. Um, serves mainly the lower limb, but also the abdomen, pelvis, and buttock. Locating the walls of the pelvis posterior to iliopsoas. Okay, so here if you look on this side, iliopsoas is here, right here, so is minor, so is major. Here they've reflected it, and that's sort of where your plexus starts to sit. There are both anterior and posterior divisions. Yellow is posterior, green is anterior. Um, this is, um, I, I don't know, I always think brachial is harder, but students usually tell me that, that the lumbar sacral is harder. I think it's because of all this, this mess down here of all these anterior and posterior divisions and the terminal branches again. Um, your terminal branches from the anterior division are tibial and sciatic and common fibular or the peroneal nerve from the posterior division. Those are your big ones. Okay. <laughs> this is your lumbosacral plexus. Um, this over here is going to tell you, you know, I don't care about subcostal. I don't care about iliohypo, ilioinguinal, genital femoral you need to know, lateral femoral you need to know, obturator femoral, superior and inferior gluteal, gluteals, nerve to piriformis, common fibular, tibial. All right, basically you need to know the rest of these. I don't care too much about 16 and 17. Okay, but the rest of these you do need to know. I know there's no there's no easy way to learn this other than to study it. Um, yeah, I got nothing to help you there. Sorry. Um, okay, so the other thing we care about in the femoral area is the femoral triangle. 
It's a fascial space that is bordered by muscles and ligaments in the superior third of the anterior thigh. And it's sort of a junction between the trunk and the lower limb. So it's, it feels sort of like a depression in the anterior medial part of the thigh. It's inferior to the inguinal ligament when the thigh is flexed, abducted, and laterally rotated. The base is formed by the inguinal ligament. Medial border is formed by adductor longus. Lateral border by sartorius. The apex of the triangle is where the lateral border of the sartorius crosses the medial border of the adductor group. And the floor is iliopsoas and pectineus. So here's what it looks like. Okay, why we care? Femoral artery and nerve are passing through here. Okay, um, very important. This is how you get blood supplied to the lower extremity. Around the femoral artery and vein, there's a fascial tube called the femoral sheath. The sheath allows the femoral artery and vein to glide deep to the inguinal ligament during movements of the hip. So as you're flexing, standing, medial and laterally rotating your hip and thigh, that sheath allows the femoral artery and nerve not to get compressed and allows them to move sort of in their own little sac or canal as they call it. Sorry, I don't know why this keeps doing this. Uh, purpose of femoral canals allow the femoral vein room to expand when venous return from the leg is increased, such as with exercise and activity. The adductor canal is another anatomical structure we care about. It is on the medial side. Uh, at the apex of the femoral triangle to the adductor hiatus in the tendon of the adductor magnus. Provides intermuscular passage through which the femoral vessels pass to reach the popliteal fossa, which is your knee. So the popliteal fossa is posterior at the knee. And that's where they change from becoming femoral vessels to popliteal vessels. Okay, femoral vessels supply your thigh. Popliteal vessels supply from your knee down. Okay, your femoral artery and vein pass through there, the saphenous nerve, and nerve to vastus medialis. Okay, and here's your adductor canal right here. And another view of it. This is a cross-section of you chop through the, the thigh. Okay, so don't panic by the lumbosacral plexus. I have another little lecture that I'll post on lumbosacral plexus that simplifies things just a little bit, not a lot, because as I said, I, I can't really a whole lot simplify it. But So there'll be a, a separate short brief lecture on lumbosacral plexus.